Jubilee Christian Church International in Durham, North Carolina. Rest, release, resources, and restoration. I will run into the efforts of my destiny in the name of Jesus. You never get to where you want to go. No, 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 no. I shall achieve. I will be a wonder unto many in the name of Jesus. And we've been talking about this series, A Counter with Jesus. A Counter with Jesus. The first one we open up, thank you. We open up with the word, Jesus, the healer. The reason behind this series, if you remember, people of God, is whatever we see in the scripture that Jesus did, he can do it in our lives. What he did in the written word that we read about, if we believe, he can repeat it again in our word. So the first one we talk about is Jesus is our healer. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that healed us. When we are sick, when our body is weak, it can bring new strength, energy. It can heal our marriage. It can heal our finances. Whatever it is in our lives that is sick, sickness is not limited to just the body. People, other areas of people's life can be sick. The second one we talk about is Jesus, our provider. We understood is our Jehovah Jireh when we run out of resources. The Bible talks about Jesus was in a particular wedding uh, in Cana of Galilee. They ran out and he was right there to provide. Jesus is our provider. And the third one we talked about was Jesus, our restorer. That was last week. That whatever the enemy took in our life, whatever we lost in time, time, resources, energy, favor, grace and glory, that he can restore it again into our life. Indeed, Jesus is our restorer. Praise the Lord. So today, in the next few minutes I have, I'm going to talk about Jesus, our deliverer. Jesus delivers. He is the deliverer. And I'm going to have uh, the theme today is a cry for deliverance. A cry for deliverance. If someone here today, you are hurting, some aspect of your life is in bondage, is in shackle, if you will cry today, it will deliver you. I say it will deliver somebody. You know, there are many things in life that entangle us. Many of us are saved, but we are not truly free. We read about the story of Lazarus last week, how he came out from the grave, but his hands were banned, his, his feet and his, and his face was banned. The scripture made us understand that Jesus gave him life, but Lazarus was not free. So there are believers who are saved but are not free. It means you are not enjoying the fullness of your salvation. That's why you need deliverance. Some things in your life, some things entangles you, some things put you in bondage. I'm talking about total set free, total deliverance for your life. So we're looking at the scripture, how Jesus went about doing good, restoring those who are oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Acts 10, 38. The Bible says it went all over the place. In 1 John 3, verse number 8, the scripture says, for this purpose, Jesus was manifested that he may destroy the works of the devil. So in your life today, every works of the devil is not permitted to stand in Jesus' name. Jesus is the deliverer. He is our deliverer. In John chapter 8 verse 36, the scripture says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. So we can be free completely. Whatever area of our lives, where the enemy put us in bondage. I want you to believe God this morning. A cry for deliverance. The Lord will set you free. In Jesus' name. Turn your Bible with me to Psalm 42. If you have a moment, I'm going to talk very quickly about four areas of our lives where we can experience true deliverance. If there's some areas of your life that you never thought that it could be, it could represent bondage, I want to show you that Jesus is willing to set us free in those four categories of life. Look at his mandate. In Psalm 42, I'm reading Psalm 42, verse number 2 and 3. The first one I'm talking about is deliverance from the miry clay of life. 
If you look at the paper in your hand, look at that script, uh, the, the paper you have. He says, the hand of the Lord is long enough to reach out at the depth of our trouble and strong enough to pull us out of it. Do you believe that? There's no how far you have gone, no, no matter how deep you have gone into, the hand of the Lord is strong enough, it's long enough, it can reach out to you. In the depth, in the pit, in the valley, even in the shadows of death itself, God's hand can reach out to you. And it's also strong enough that it can pull you out. So look at Psalm 42, verse number 2 and 3. I'm going to just make because of our time. Psalm 42, verse 2 and 3. It says, he brought me up also out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock. I moved from the pit to the rock. He brought me out of an horrible, horrible pit. I don't know, someone here today, maybe that is your description. You are in some horrible pit. Some what I call the miry clay of life. And what did he do? He set my feet upon a rock and he established my goings. Verse 3, and he had put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see and fear and they shall trust the Lord. He brought me out of the miry clay. The first thing I'm talking about is deliverance from the miry clay of life. You can see that in your outline. What is the miry clay of life? That is the question I ask the Lord. What does it mean in our lives when we are in the miry clay? I call that the when you are facing problems and troubles that tend to swallow you up. When situations that are bigger than yourself trying to destroy and consume you. Miry clay of life. In Psalm 50, verse number 15, the psalmist says, And call upon me. God was, was God speaking through the psalmist. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. God says there is deliverance in my hands in the day of your trouble. It's a matter of when, not if. Because one way or the other, many of us will fall into trouble. You know what I'm talking about? Scripture says many are the afflictions, not few. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord said, when you call upon me in the day of your trouble, I will answer you. I will deliver you. From the miry clay. So what is miry clay? It means the problems and troubles of life that tend to swallow us up. Number two, it means messy situations of life where you could not free yourself. Any of us who are familiar with what they call the quicksand. Quicksand. You know, that's a picture of that day. A quicksand, it, it, looks, it, it, it looks, I mean, it, it pretends to be a solid ground until you put your leg inside of it. And the moment your leg inside of it, you begin to go down. The more you try to get out, the more it sucks you in. Anybody familiar with quicksand? Look at that one. Don't go near quicksand because it's a dangerous place. Some of us are in what I call a quicksand of life. The more you struggle, the more it drags you in. And it looks like you are not coming out of that situation. That's what they call miry clay of life. I'm praying this morning, the hand of the Lord will stretch out and it will deliver you out of it. It can do that. You know, when someone is in a quicksand, you need help. You can't get yourself out. No matter, how, in fact, the more you struggle, the more it becomes worse. You, it keep on sucking you. Look at that face. Please show them the picture. Look at that face. The, the lady was sucked up to her face. Almost done. Almost gone. But the Lord is merciful. He will deliver us this morning. Well, number three, what does it mean? Miracle of life means dangerous circumstances that is about to consume your lives. Look at the life of, of, of Peter. The scripture talk about one day Peter was walking on the sea. And of course, according to the word of the law, until he began to be afraid. He began to look around. And the Bible says he began to sink. But Matthew 14 verse 30. Say when he saw the wind boasterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried saying, Lord, save me. 
three words that came from the mouth of Peter. And those three words were strong enough to bring him out. As you cry this morning, this is your cry, Lord, save me. Come and say with me, Lord, save me. I don't know what a mess you have around your life. The more you struggle, the more it sucks you in. Maybe it's called financial mess. I mean, marital trouble, burdens all over your life. The more you are swimming in, the more it looks like you're not going to come to an end of it. I'm saying this morning, it will set you free. In Jesus' name. Fin I mean, troubles around our life. It is what I call the mighty clay of life. Look at that scripture again. The first one says, it says, it brought me up out of an horrible pit. So there are three miracles in that verse number two. It brought me up. I call that the miracle of deliverance. It brought me up. Number two, it says, it set my feet upon a rock. I call that the miracle of restoration. It set my feet upon the rock. He established my going. Number three, he put a new song in my mouth. I call it the miracle of new beginning. I pray for someone this morning, no matter how deep you are, he will bring you out of that mighty clay and he will set your feet on the rock and he will give you a new song. In Jesus' name. Number one thing that we're talking about is mighty clay of life. Deliverance from the mighty clay. You feel that in your paper? What the three things means, what it does when we are facing crisis in life. I look at a person in the scripture and I was reading about him, a man called Jonah. See, what do you do when you are in a mighty clay? I want to give you some scriptural advice. Maybe you have a mountain of debt that is about to swallow you. It looks like there's no way out of it. What do you do when you are in a dead end street? It looks like nothing around your life is working. I want to show you what Jonah did. The Bible talks about Jonah. You remember Jonah? He ran away, isn't it? He was, uh, we're going to talk about that midweek, this, uh, this Wednesday. He was a classical example of disobedience. God told Jonah, go to Nineveh. Jonah said, no, I will not. Isn't that amazing? He, he looked God, I but I said, God, you can keep it. I'm not going there. He turned his, his face against God, turned his back to God, and went the other opposite direction. And as he was going, God's hand was against him. The scripture says he began to go down. Everything in his life was going down. He went down to the belly of the whale, uh, of, a, of a fish. We know it's a whale. You got, we can't think of a whale. Praise the Lord. We don't know what kind of a fish. The Bible call it a fish, right? Hello, are you with me this morning? But we don't know what it is, but most Bible scholars believe it was a whale that could swallow a man up and contain his whole entire body. If Jonah want to cook, he could cook. <laughs> Everything was in that, and the fish did not feel a thing. That must be a big fish, isn't it? Now, look at Jonah chapter 2 verse 1. What do you do when you are in a hell of a trouble? Look at Jonah verse chapter 2 verse 1. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, is God out of the fish belly. When you are in trouble, he prayed. The Bible says he prayed unto God in verse number 2. And he said, I cried by reason of mine affliction. Praise the Lord. Thank you, sir. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me out of the belly of hell, cried I, and thou hearest me. See, we call it the fish belly, but do not call it hell. What is hell? Hell means a separation from God. Hell is hell because God is not there. Anywhere in your life where God's presence is cut off, that is called hell. The scripture that this guy found himself inside the belly of this fish. And you can imagine the, the, the temperature in that belly. Someone says it's about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Indeed, it was in hell. See, the, 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 all the liver and the intestine of the fish was slapping his face left, right. He got a dirty slap that day. See, when you are in disobedience to God, the enemy will beat you down and slap you nonsense. And the scripture says he cried to God. He repented. He, he prayed unto God. And God heard his voice. No matter how far you have gone, you can cry to God in the belly of hell. And God will hear you. 
He turned again to the creator and the Lord delivered him. The Lord spoke to the whale. You know, that is amazing. That's a miracle. Every whale of life that swallows you. I speak the word of life now that they will vomit you in Jesus' name. I don't know. See, I'm talking about spiritual thing here. I'm not talking about literally fish. Some of you, you are some, some belly of, of a fish in your workplace. They want to destroy your career. They rope you around. They rope mistake around you. And you know there's no way getting out. But the Lord shall deliver you. I said the Lord shall deliver you. You know, maybe it's your marriage that is in trouble. There's no way it's going to crash. Everything con concerned the marriage is going the opposite direction. The in-laws, the outlaws, everybody's against you. But God will deliver you out of that marriage claim. God spoke to, to the fish. You know, the, the, God can speak physiology because he created the fish, isn't it? See, the fish heard the voice of God and said, go carry Jonah to where he didn't want to go. See, the, the fish had the GPS working in his head. The, the fish knew the place, the way to Nineveh. You remember Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, isn't it? The Bible didn't tell us that Jonah had to take another boat. You <laughs> know, the fish went to Nineveh. Even fish hear the voice of the creator. We are the one that won't listen to the voice of our master. Even the fish said, yes, sir, Lord. And he took Jonah straight to Nineveh and he vomited him. I'm saying this morning, every fish that swallowed you or swallowed your blessing, they will vomit you in the name of Jesus. It looks you are too far from your destination, but God knows how to, how to cut the distance in half. The fish went through the shortcut. GPS was running his head, turn left, turn right, and here is Nineveh. And when he got there, he knew what to do with, jo with Jonah. You are not supposed to hit him. You are supposed to throw it from it him. See, God put Jonah in hell, not to destroy him, but to spank him. So have you need some spanking? You've been going the wrong direction. If God needs to spank you, let him do that, but not destroy you. Mighty clay of life. When things are like you are in a hell. Number three things you can do. First one is cry out for deliverance. See, the cry to God is called the cry of mercy. Every time you say, God, have mercy upon me. See, you turn the bowels of the Almighty. No matter how bad you are, when God hears a cry for mercy, he responds. The way a woman will respond to the cry of an infant. No matter how wicked that woman is. Of course, sometimes the woman says, you know what, baby, I'm just tired. You just put the baby in the lock the door. No, but when the baby keeps crying, you know, some babies are very good in crying. Yeah, like, oh, yeah, ma, ma. I say, oh, baby. Even if you do not go for the baby, you will not sleep. So what do you do? You go take care of the baby. The, the, the bowel of the Lord is full of mercy. When you cry, Lord, help me, it will help you. So number one thing you do today, cry to him for deliverance. Number two, repent because we saw Jonah did that. Your cry will not hear, you will not get to the ears of the father and make him respond until you have shown a sign of repentance. How did you get yourself into the mighty clay to start with? You got to find your way out and get back. You got to relocate yourself or locate where you got lost so that it can pull you out of the mighty clay of life. The first question he asks Adam and Eve. He says, Adam, where are you? Before we can help you, we have to locate where you are. If you don't know where you are, you are really lost. You need repentance. These people are crying. I'm praying for you, but you are not repentant. That's why you are still in the mighty clay. God's hand is about to pull you out. But they want you to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I messed up. Lord, I got myself in trouble. And it will set you free. Number three, you must do, you must surrender and stop struggling. So those are the three things. There are many, many three things you could write here this morning, but there's no time to write all of them. But just put them out there in your, in your material. You must cry out, repent, and surrender. When you're in a mighty clay, the last thing you must be doing is struggling. Is that right? If you are struggling, what happened to it? You go deeper. We're told that uh, when uh, those who say folks, what they call them, life raft, what they, lifeguard, that when they are about to save a person who is drowning, see, they don't jump in right away when you are doing your wallow wallow on the, they, they let you finish. 
Because they know by, by experience that when you are struggling, gasping for air, if a lifeguard job in there, you will pull him down with, he, with yourself and both of you will drown. You know what they let you do? They let you finish all your pata 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 and say, all right. <laughs> then they, at the nick of time, they get you up. See, when you stop surrendering. See, many of you, the reason why God wouldn't get you is you have 1,000 ways to have manipulating things. Your patapata is troubling everybody else. God couldn't, he couldn't help you because you did not surrender. I surrender, or it's only in song, but truly you did not surrender to him. Your life is not surrender. So what is going to happen? You're going to keep struggling and the mighty clay is going to suck you in. The way I would say, Lord, I yield it to you. I let you have your way. You remember the illustration I usually give when people who caught bird, you know, in some part of the country, they help you trim your bird. They don't do it here. Everybody shave their own stuff, isn't it? In some country, you actually pay people to, to help you cut your bird. They do? All right. I hope nobody's using that service. They do. <laughs> All right. I know the rich do. You know, they have somebody just put their... But I, I, they have that. Okay, great, great. It's good. Nice. I have seen <laughs> some in, in where I grew up, they call them malam. Or another word for it is a, a mister. Somebody will walk. And he has this fine razor. <laughs> Sharp. And accurate. If it does like this, film, <laughs> the hair is gone. <laughs> and you hold on. You 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 close your eyes. You surrender your neck. <laughs> Man, if you don't surrender, you are in trouble. It's just a film. <laughs> the hair is gone. But you do, no, no, wait a minute. What is he gonna do? He will cut your throat. You understand what surrender means? When we are struggling with God, we won't let God have his way. God, this is what I want with conditions. If you don't do it this time, Lord, I'm out. I quit. I'll find another alternative. If you do that to God, he will leave you in your mighty clay. You need to say, God, I come to a point of surrender. That was what happened to Jacob when he struggled with the angel. You remember all night, and he just let me go, Jacob. Let me go. I will not let you go until you bless me. And when the time was right, the Bible said the angel touched him on a star. And he, he dislocated his, he, the hollow of a star. And you know what that means? Every time Jacob does like this, it's a reminder when you struggle with God, <laughs> it dislocates your tie. You understand that? That you cannot depend on yourself. You cannot depend on your energy. You cannot depend on your power. You got to go to a point of surrender and let God help you out. I'm praying this morning, whatever you are struggling with, He will stretch forth His long hand and He will deliver you. In Jesus' name. Number two, deliverance from demonic oppression. If you permit me, I will, I'm going to rush through this, but I want to give you some word that you can run with about Jesus, our deliverer. Deliverance from demonic oppression. I'm talking about four categories of deliverance uh, this morning. The first one is deliverance from trouble, from the mighty clay. The second one is deliverance from demonic oppression, nightmares, afflictions in your dreams, on your bed. The devil is stealing stuff from you. Jesus can deliver us and he will deliver us. Turn your Bible with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Let's read that to very few verses there. Uh, there's, there's a story of a man who was in trouble, who needed deliverance. Demonic affliction in verse number one. And they came over onto the other side of the sea into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tomb a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man, no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. 
Verse 5, and always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs crying and cutting himself with stones. That man is, was under demonic affliction. I'm praying for somebody here today. Sometimes some people have some dreams. They just wake up and you see some, some stripe of, of cane behind you. Anybody had that before? Say, who, who, who beat you in the night? Some demonic stuff. These things are real, people of God. Some years ago, I used, used to have some experience, some very nasty experience. When I gave my life to Christ, it was like the devil was just mad. Literally, I could not sleep in the afternoon. I was afraid to sleep in the afternoon because something would come around to choke life out of me. And I was crying to God, God deliver me. God deliver me. I didn't have that until I knew Christ. So it kind of confused me. When I was not a child of God, the devil left me alone because he didn't, want, he didn't bother me. Some of us who are born again, who are fired for the law, you have battles in your life. You wonder why? Because the devil noticed you. You have become noticeable. When you were not a believer, you were nobody. He just didn't have time for you. Now you become dangerous. The enemy will come and choke me, hold my throat. I will be struggling. Literally, it will be like somebody came to the house. Literally, I feel presence. That is called demonic oppression. You are not possessed, it's oppressing your body. I don't know if I'm talking to real people this way, I'm talking to angels. Those who never know what that is. Some folks have some very nasty dreams, like somebody showed up in your dream, carry you with faith, with anger. <laughs> you woke up, your, your heart in your mouth, you were jumping, you knew it was an oppression. Ladies have testified how they were pregnant, then some force came around and looked like somebody had an affair with them, and then the, the baby was lost. These are real people of God. Demons are real in our world. They are not figment of somebody's imagination. We have real enemies, but we have real victory. In the name of Jesus, every afflictions of the devil will stop in your life. In Jesus' name. These things are real. So this man was under serious oppression until Jesus showed up. Look at verse number 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and he worshipped and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is your name? And he answered, my name is Legion, for we are many. See, the demon spoke of, we are many in this life. We trouble his marriage, we trouble his mind, we mess him up. Because of time, I'm going to shorten this message. There are so many things we could study about that man. But it's called, oppre he was oppressed, he was possessed. In fact, all of the three levels of affliction was operating in his life. There are three levels. One is called possession. The other one is called obsession. The third one is called uh, oppression. A Christian can be oppressed, but not obsessed. Thank you for watching today's program. For more information, visit us on our website at www.jubileenc.org or email us at info at Thank you and have a blessed day.